absent this evening. I don't hear her. She's not on the phone. I don't see anyone okay. uh, that's called in. Before we begin the meeting, I would like to remind the audience that we have posted this agenda on the Secretary of State's website, as well as the Woonsocket Education Department's website. We have stated on the agenda that this is a teleconference meeting and provided the different ways of joining this meeting. In addition to the dial-in phone number and the website link, the public can tune in to WOON Radio Channel 1240 for AM radio or Channel 99.5 for FM radio. I would also like to remind the audience that we are holding this meeting pursuant to the governor's executive order recognizing the need for people to maintain a safe distance from one another during the COVID-19 pandemic and allowing public bodies to convene virtually for the purpose of conducting essential business. In accordance with that order, the committee's meeting tonight is for the purpose of conducting essential business only. And for this reason, the meeting will not include a public comment, period. I will ask you to please join me in a moment of silence and hopefully, uh, we can think about having more peaceful days in our city, our state, and our country. And now I'll recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I believe we do not have any recognition and announcements tonight, so we'll go right into the approval of minutes. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the June 24, 2020 open session minutes. Is there a second? Second. Does any member have any changes, amendments, additions? Hearing none, Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kapitskas. Yes. We'll move on to uh, the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Burke. Uh, does any member have any, uh, want to take any items out of, out of the uh, consent agenda or discuss any issue that's within the consent agenda? Hearing none, Dr. Ma McGee? Ma yes? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to uh, revise a requisition we have. It's uh, 210128. Uh, it's a requisition for uh, for Whelan. And uh, there was an additional line on that for $90 that I'd like to remove from the requisition. Does anybody have any... Uh would you explain why why you're doing that, Mr. Perrier? It, yeah, there was just an error when we created the requisition. Uh, the the uh, requisition is done for the full contract amount, uh, but we put an extra line on. It was just a ninety dollar line, and I'd like to remove it from the requisition. That's all. It's a very small adjustment. It was made an error on our our part in our office, and we'd like to remove it. So, anybody have any discussion on that? So I'll make a motion to amend the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. On the amendment only, Dr. McGee? Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? I don't see her. I think I she left the meeting. Ask Lynn. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Thank you. Now on the full uh, consent agenda as amended. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mr. Kapiskas. Yes. Mr. Capwell. Thank you. I, I, don't think she, I don't think she's there, but. I think we, we lost her. Uh, next, we'll go into your report, Dr. McGee. Now, and your report, the way it's listed on the agenda, we have uh, the school reopening, but also towards the end of the agenda, um, we have a uh, discussion on the district's reopening plan. This is something that's, separate, correct? Uh, no, they're actually the same. So I, I was going to um, ask ask you if we could take out of order 
the um, the, the part in uh, under new business because that that has the link to the plan that um, part of the plan that we're submitting to ride. So you want to cover all that now in your superintendent's report? I, I do, yes. Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to move this item on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second by Vice Chair Burke. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Not here. Okay. All right, let's, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. McGee. So you've got reopening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, each member of the school committee has um, under new business, the link to two documents. The first document is a cover section of the plan that we are gonna be submitting to the Department of Education on Friday. So the, the cover uh, section is approximately seven or eight pages that's that's not really the meat and potatoes of the plan so i'm not going to get into this I, I will just describe what this uh packet or this cover section looks like it has a message from the superintendent which um, is sent to to ride which will be sent to uh, our families which just sort of describes the um the process that the district went in creating their reopening uh, plan. It also lists a section of vision and guiding principles for reopening, hopes and aspirations for the fall, the process of building the plan, uh, reinforcing the need to be agile and flexible, and um, guiding principles uh, of, of, our, of, of our district with respect to reopening, strengths and challenges that we face, that our, our families and our staff and our students faced from the distance learning experience in the spring. Um, and then the final uh, category is the critical components of the reopening plan, which is what I'm gonna talk about here um, next. So, so this, this section, as I said, is the cover section, which will accompany the plan that I send to ride on Friday. So the second section that you have is titled Winsocket Education Department 20. 2021 reopening plan. So that, that's a pretty lengthy document. Um, I'm going to explain the document first. I'm going to explain how the document has been put together. And, and then I'm going to go through each of the areas um, with the committee. Um, and if you have questions while I'm going along, you know, please uh, don't hesitate to ask me. Uh, there are about 14 sections to this reopening plan. Um, and again, this is this is the second of, of three uh, portions of the reopening plan that we're going to be submitting to ride. The third section, which is not included in this, um, are questions that each LEA or local education um, agency had to answer, um, which are really found in the body of the actual plan itself. Um, we're still working on answering those questions. We're almost finished, um, but we haven't completely finished them yet. But again, what you really want to hear this evening is, is what I'm going to go over next. And that, again, is the body of the plan. Just to update everyone on the process and how we got to where we are this evening. So um, as you know, the governor um, issued a, um, a, a, a statement to uh, school districts across the state that um, school districts will reopen on August 31st. Um, and as a result, uh, the commissioner and ride is expecting plans to be submitted to them by Friday the 17th. So in um, part of that, what we did here in Woonsocket is we created a task force, which was made up of community members, um, district staff and personnel, uh, union leadership, as well as um, two members of the Woonsocket School Committee. From, and that task force's charge is to oversee the process um, of creating the plan for reopening. And that process includes establishing four working groups. There were four categories, major categories, that every district has to uh, take into account and establish plans for, for the reopening. And those are um, instruction, reopening operations, uh, health and safety, 
And then the final one is um, social, emotional, and mental health for students and for staff. So the working groups were charged with um, putting those sections together. Um, and as I said a moment ago, the, some of the questions that we have still to answer um, come from those working groups and the work that they're doing. Um, we also have been working with uh, a company that the Department of Education has hired to work with districts across the state on their reopening plans. It's called the District Management Group, and they're a firm out of Boston. They're working with districts across the country as they put in their, their plan. We also in Woonsocket have been working with um, myself specifically and uh, Robert Stewart, our uh, union president, have been working with other um, AFT union districts in the state um, in collaborating on the structure of our plans. And those um, AFT districts, there are about nine of us. Um, and we have very similar, if not identical um, plans. There are, there are certainly some nuances, but um, we've been working with them as well. Uh, we've also sent out surveys to parents and families, asking them about their experience with homeschooling this past spring, as well as questions about uh, the reopening and what it might look like and what their feelings are with respect to the reopening and other things such as, you know, could they provide transportation if need be um, or not. So that's the process to date. Um, so let me start by going through the first section of the plan. As I said, there are about 14 um, categories in this plan. The first category is, is the overview of school reopening scenarios. The, um, the governor and the, the uh, Department of Education is asking each district to submit three types of scenarios for reopening. The first scenario is full in-person learning. That means everyone comes back at the same time. Um, and we would have to take many things into consideration, which were part of the guidance and the guidelines that the Department of Health and the Department of Education have released. Um, little feedback there, I'm not sure. Um, so that, so that, that was the first plan, or the first option, I should say. Second option is partial in person. And that's where you have a limited number of students attending school each day. Um, and then the limited in person is the third category, which is a situation where you have even less students attending each, each day. So I'll give you an example of those. So I gave you an example of what full in person would look like. That means everyone comes back pre K through 12. Partial in person means that we have um, a, a certain percentage, half of the population would be returning to school on a hybrid model. And a hybrid, a hybrid model. So someone out there has, has their, if everyone could mute, I, I'm getting a lot of a lot of static. I'm sure someone who's, who's not muted. Thank you. Um, so the partial in person is having a portion of students come back to school um, and it's a hybrid form, which means you would have a portion of the week where students are in person with their teachers and a portion of the week where students are um, in a virtual distance learning um, setting. Same thing for limited in person, but that would be even um, an, an even smaller group of students. It might just be our at risk students, our differently able students. Um, it would be limited to, to um, a cohort of, of, of students that would fall in that category. So the, the plan that we are moving forward with here in Woonsocket, or the plan that we are proposing to the um, Department of Education is the partial in-person learning um, option. So that, what that's gonna look like, I'm gonna go by level by level. I'm gonna start with elementary, I'm gonna go to middle, and then I'll go to high school. So Mondays would be a virtual learning day for students in grades pre-K through five, which means that they would be continuing what they experienced in the spring on Mondays. The reason we selected Mondays as a virtual day 
and and as you'll as you'll hear as I move on from um, level to level, Monday will be a virtual day for all students across the district. The reason for that is with the statewide schedule that was submitted by the the commissioner recently on mondays those are the days uh there's there's one monday each month i think with the exception of june where um, those are professional learning days for teachers so teachers will be um experiencing professional learning whether it's through the district um professional development opportunities or through opportunities that the state is providing um, all districts. In addition to that, we frequently see that holidays fall on Mondays during the school year. So we felt as though um, if we were gonna select one virtual day across the district, that would be the best day that would make the most sense to have it on Monday. So getting back to elementary. So students in pre-K and K, um, because those are considered transition grades, will be attending um, school in full Tuesday through Friday. So they'll be in school Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They will not be in on Monday. As, as I said, that'll be a virtual um, day. Students in grades one through five, we're gonna break those their, their schedule up, their hybrid schedule up into um, two days and two days. So for example, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, students whose last name begins with the letters A through L will be attending in person on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Those students who attend on Tuesdays and Wednesdays will be virtual on Thursday and Friday, letters A through L. On Thursday and Friday, we'll have the students in person with the last name beginning with the, the letter M through Z. So that's elementary, one through five. So again, just to summarize, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten will be in Tuesday through Friday. Grades one through five will be in letters A through L, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then letters M through Z, Thursday and Friday. So if, for example, Patrick McGee is uh, a second grader. On Monday and Tuesday, he has virtual instruction. He will be in on Thursdays and Fridays. So that's how that's going to work at the elementary level. Now, before I, I move on to the middle school, just so everybody understands um, that there are many families in our, in our district, many students in our district, who have siblings with different last names. So what we're doing is we're going to use the oldest sibling's last name. So, you know, if if my, you know, Patrick McGee is in second grade and he has a sibling who's, you know, who whose last name is Smith, uh, or or actually that's um, that's not not a good example. Is um, you know his last name is Allen, then then I would attend when my older sibling attends based on the last, um, the first initial of the last name. So that will hopefully clear up some confusion with families who have siblings with um, different last names. Um, at, the, at the middle school level, we're bringing back sixth graders full time in grade, um, on days Tuesday through Friday. Again, Monday is a virtual day across the district. Grades seven and eight will be doing, will be having a, a hybrid schedule similar to what our grades uh, one through five students are. So if I'm a seventh or an eighth grader and my last name begins with the letter A through L, then Tuesdays and Wednesdays is when I will be attending in person. And Thursday, Friday would be my virtual day, days. If I have the last name with the letters M through Z, I'm in person on Thursdays and Fridays, and I'm in virtually, or I'm, I'm out virtually Tuesday and Wednesdays. For the high school, all students, um, again, will have a virtual day on Monday. 
on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, all students with the last name A through L will be in in person. I'm going to explain the high school schedule a little bit after I after I finish with the um, the breakup of the the days in the alphabet because the high school schedule is w w was much more challenging than the middle and the elementaries because um, of the fact that high school students don't travel for the most part in in pods or or groups that would follow one another from class to class. High school has electives. It's very challenging. But the high school would be Tuesdays and Wednesdays, last name A through L, Thursday, Friday, M through Z. So a high school student's schedule um, would look like this. So on week one, during week one, there are, first of all, there are five periods each day. And this is when they're they're in person. So their first period class, they would be in in person with their first period teacher. They're, they, so they're going to stay there throughout throughout the day. Now they're they're, they're going to have a, a chance to stretch their legs and, and move. I mean, they're not going to just be kept in a classroom for six hours. But um, what we are trying to avoid at the high school is having kids traveling to all different sections of the building at once or even in groups because if you have a classroom of um, of say 15 students and, and that's how it's going to be broken up when we when we have these uh, when we have this this hybrid approach we're not going to have all of the students in the classroom at once so you'll have half the number that you normally would have um, so if you have say 15 students you could have 10 of those students traveling to totally different locations in different classrooms in the building. And that's something that we have to uh, try to avoid based on the social distancing guidance and guidelines. So period one, I would be um, in person with, with my teacher. Um, period two, I would stay there and I would be um, having my instruction virtually with my second period teacher who is in the, who is also in the school with another class. So that, that's going to be very challenging. Um, that's something that the high school, uh, Mr. Henderson and um, Mrs. Hawkins um, and the leadership team there are going to be working on. Um, but in terms of not having st many students going in, in different directions and in different areas of the high school, they felt as though this was the best scenario to keep students in in um, in pods or in in similar groups as often as they could so period three they would be virtually with their period three teacher and so on and so forth the second week so so all week they would have that period one teacher in person week two they would have their period two teacher and they would have that teacher in person for the entire week would stay there and they would have the other classes, the other periods would be held virtually. So when the students are in the classroom, they'll have um, headphones or, you know, uh, ear buds to use um, while they are um, getting their instruction virtually through other, other teachers that are, that are in the building. The, um, and that will be the same at the career center. Now, one, one unique situation we have at the Career Center is we have um, our preschool. We have the daycare. Um, Mr. Webb and Mr. Henderson are going to be working on uh, with, with the teachers in the preschool as to what that's going to look like. Now, we, we would have to follow, obviously, the state guidance when it comes to daycares, um, and we would have to follow um, those types of um, social distancing and those, um, as I said, those guidelines from um, the state. So they're they're working on that um, as well. So that that's that's I, what I what I think a lot of people were were interested to hear is what is the structure going to look like, um, and and that's what our proposal is going to be in terms of the structure, in terms of what grades will come back. Um, it's our it's our hope that you know hopefully things go well as we start the school year 
hopefully the the number of cases statewide um, go down. And I know they've there's been a spike over over the last week or so. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like at at the end of the summer. So, um, but there has been a spike. We hope that you know when we implement this plan that the numbers in Winsocket go down. Um, we hope that we don't have any cases of students or staff who, you know, who have this, the symptoms and test positive um, because the, the, the plan is, you know, as we move along from week to week is to gradually bring back more students uh, more regularly. So, but, but again, that's based on what, what's happening in our community and in our schools. So although this is the plan to start, um, our, our intent and our goal is to bring back more classes um, more frequently. Any questions? I, I know I just gave you a lot to digest, and, and that's only the, the tip of the iceberg. But uh, do you have any questions with respect to those, uh, that, that scenario? Dr. McGee, um, just a couple of things. Um, as you mentioned, we're, we're talking about the oldest sibling. Is that going to is that going to be the same if I've got a family with uh, students in the same family, different names, in elementary, middle school, and high school? As a as a as an example, will we go with the oldest schedule? Is that how that's going to work? Because maybe all all, all those kids in the family have to go to school together. So they're not just in elementary, they could be exactly. in middle school and they yeah. could be in high school. That's correct. And, and that's so that if, if, uh, if I'm a high school student and I have two younger siblings and my last name is different and, you know, uh, so we want to make it so that, that parents um, don't have to juggle multiple schedules with multiple uh, children and in some cases the older sibling watches the younger siblings so we want to try to make it um, in um, as as you know as 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 acceptable as possible um, for for them now for for parents and families who choose not to send their children to school mm -hmm. um, so I would assume that they're going to be virtual all the time so 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 yes so we we can't force families to to send their their children in if they don't feel comfortable um, the the survey that we sent out uh, approximately a week ago um, the feedback that we received was was about 60 65 percent were not comfortable sending their children back to school regardless of the plan so, um, so yeah, much like other districts across the state, um, if, if a parent feels as though it's not safe to send their child in, then, um, and, and they choose not to homeschool, and we don't want them to homeschool their children, because as, as you know, um, when, when parents homeschool their children, that's funding that, that we lose. We lose that per pupil funding, so we don't want that. Um, so the... Um, I lost my train of thought there for a second. So we we want to to make it so that um, parents have the option of of distance learning. So and we're in the process now of of well, how's that going to look? If you have a teacher, I'll, and I'll and I'll use I I could use any level, but I'm going to use an elementary level. If you have a, a fifth grade teacher who has you know a, a certain number of students in his or her class who are whose parents are electing to have them continue virtually, then that classroom teacher can't juggle an in-person class and a virtual class. So we're, we're gonna need to look at our staffing across the district. Um, and there, there will be some teachers who, who will be unable to return due to me medical conditions. We're gonna need to find out what those numbers are um, before too long to get a sense of what teachers would be um, available to um, who are not in the classroom physically would be then responsible for 
are virtual students. So it might be teachers who, who's, who have students, depending on the number of students and, and families who, who choose not to come back, um, might have, so, so, so their rosters may look different. They might not just have kids in their school. Um, the, the, the goal is to do that, um, but we have to do, you know, we, we have to make the best of that situation because we don't know how many students, how many families at, at the very end will choose to um, continue the virtual instruction over the hybrid form that we have. We received a, a, about, oh, we received a little over 900 responses um, from our families. Dr. It, McGee, yeah. you mentioned something about uh, basically enrollment. Uh, all our kids are gonna be enrolled. They're just not, they're just not gonna, they're gonna stay virtual, just like they're having. If, if we all went virtual, which would have been the last plan where we have to stay home, you still have a whole district of 6,000 kids to teach. Right. They're not going anywhere. Your teachers still have to teach. Right. So they're gonna be teaching at home. Uh, they're gonna have to be preparing their lessons plans. They're gonna have to uh, communicate with their students. They're gonna have to be. Uh, they're gonna have to do everything and more um, well, in terms of managing their classroom. So I don't see how uh, this is going to affect our budget from in terms of of our uh, when we're looking at attendance. Yes, we may not have to have substitutes, but we may have to. Uh, if a teacher gets sick, you're gonna still need substitutes that are gonna be able to be able to do virtual teaching. Um, the only thing I see, one of the big things, is we may not need the transportation costs. So that's the only thing I see. But I don't see a reduction in attendance. Uh, you're either going to school at home or you're going to school in the school. Right. So, so there are two different. Types of, yeah. So there are two different types of scenarios. The the first scenario is is the the high just the hybrid model itself. So students are going to be in person, and then there are going to be days when they're not in person. So those days that they're not in person, the teachers and and our, and all of our teachers have Google Classroom, um, and and they're you know this this spring, um, they they became very adept at creating their Google Classrooms, and so they would create assignments for those students um, who are virtual during the week. That's that's one scenario. Um, the other scenario is, are, are those students that are virtual all the time? Um, and that's the situation where we would need to establish um, a, a, a group of teachers and, and other districts are, um, are working on this and, and are, are you know, in the beginning of putting plans together. So of the pool of teachers, there, there will be some that, that don't come back for a variety of mainly um, medical reasons. So that would be the pool that we would go to for the students who are learning virtually at home. So it's really so it's really two things. You're right. What you're saying is right. It's just two different scenarios that right. we that that teachers would be planning for. Have we? Oh, oh no, I'm never sorry. mind. You go, Paul. I'll wait until you're done. Have we had meetings? Um, um, Mr. Notariani, Dr. McGee, uh, Mr. Perrier with the busing company to start discussing these plans and how that's going to affect our transportation, especially with the routes and everything. I got to believe that's one of the, the biggest items uh, that we got to deal with. We have had conversations with them. Um, just, just really fast before, before I get into that. Um, the the survey that we that we got back from the parents, one of the questions was um, the what you know what um, if the school building is reopened, which method of transportation will your child children most likely use? Um, and fifty two percent responded that their 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 child will be dropped off. Um, and then we had about twenty percent who said that their child their children will take the bus. So um, again, it's 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 based off of 900 parents. But that 900, they have siblings. It's not it's not just 900 students. You take that, and anyway, you all understand that, I'm sure. Yeah. So that that was the response that we received from the um, from the families thus far. But we have had conversations with with Durham, and we've actually had conversations with um, uh, Mr. Legary, Bill Legary, who's actually 
um, here in the meeting tonight uh, from Valley Transportation, um, uh, you know, about what 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 is that going to look like? Because the the CDC guidelines, you know, that that are out so far say that you know you can really only have about 24 students on a large bus because they have to be socially distanced every other row um, unless you know there are siblings on the bus and siblings can can sit together i think up to three in a seat because that's that's the, the maximum number of that can it can um <clears throat> can be in a seat on a bus but al, al you want to you want to um offer anything We've had some initial conversations with Durham Transportation Services. Um, they are aware of the guidelines that's been issued by the Department of Health, and they have assured us that they have uh, enough buses to meet their con their proposed contractual obligations, and they have enough bus drivers for the, those buses that they've provided in prior years. They are looking to see how that they could increase their fleet size for one socket to accommodate students based on the new um, guidelines in terms of how many students can be on a bus at a time. So I think they, along with pretty much all the transportation providers in the state are struggling with this right now. But we don't have any further information from them. We do have a call, I think, that'll be coming up next week sometime, where I think attorney Robert will be on the call with us along with Mr. Perrier to, to discuss um, what we're doing to do going forward. As the committee is aware, they have we're concerned in this area because that we, they've struggled in the past to transport our students, and, and now this is a, an even greater burden on them. And we'll see. Mrs. Capwell, you had you you had questions or comments? Yeah, my question is it was kind of twofold, but also goes off of the 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 comment about offering the opt out option for parents, which I'm really pleased to see that that consideration um, was was given to that. But I guess then my question becomes, what what happens after Friday, right? So we submit this plan, you submit your recommendation, it goes in for review. And just so that any parents that might be on the call tonight listening about what the proposal is, I guess, is there a world in which our plan as proposed does not get accepted or there's recommendations and mandated tweaks. I, I, I'm asking out of sheer ignorance for the next step process. So maybe if I'm unfamiliar with it, some of those on the line might be as well. Could you help us understand a little bit more what happens after Friday? Absolutely. So so first, um, RIDE is, is pushing districts to have all students in grades pre-K through five uh, enter um, everyone, all elementary re-enter. Um, there are aren't many districts in the state who are presenting plans that have that as their reopening plan, um, and we're included. And as I said um, a little while ago, we've been working with the other AFT districts on very similar plans. Personally, I feel as, as though it's not safe at this point in time to bring back all of our pre-K through grade five student. Um, I think when you look at how we have to socially distance, and, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little while, um, I, I just don't think it's safe. Now, do I want all of our kids back in school? Absolutely, that's where they need to be. But my, my number one job is to ensure the safety and the health of all of our students and all of our staff. And I, you know, as, I, as I indicated earlier, I wanna do this slowly. I don't want to just jump into this. Um, we know that Woonsocket is one of the five communities, was one of the five, and it probably still is, with, with the highest rate of, of COVID-19 in the state of Rhode Island. Um, so my, you know, my, my job is to ensure the safety of, of all of our kids and, and all, of our, all of our staff. Um, to answer that question specifically, <clears throat> Mrs. Capwell, so we're going to submit the plan on Friday, and uh, what has been explained to us is that RIDE will not either approve or, or not approve the plans, but they'll provide feedback on the plans. So for example, if there is something about our plan that would put um, the safety of students and staff at risk, then they would provide um, some feedback on that. If, if there is a, a category here uh, of the questions that we have been charged to answer, where they're a little um, 
you know, it might be ambiguous and they, they might have some further questions about it. Uh, they, they would provide feedback there. But it, it's my understanding that that ride is not going to say you can't do this. Thank you so much. And um, I failed to start off my comment with the sincerest thanks to the individuals that have been putting in countless hours in developing this very deliberate plan. So I, I apologize for that. And I'm going to refrain from any other questions because you may actually answer them as you go through some of your next segment. So thank you, everyone. Mr. Chairman. Vice Chair Burke. Okay, just a quick question for Patrick. I understand the elementary plan. Yep. I understand the middle school. Explain to me week one in the high school. Yep. Week okay. one, Tuesday, period one. Who's in that classroom? So so week one, period one, let's say I have social studies. On Tuesday. Okay. Um, on Tuesday, right, Tuesday, because Monday All is right. a virtual day. So Tuesday, I'm I'm with say my social studies teacher. Period one, I'm with I'm with him or her. Period one, two, now, three, now, four. Now who are you? Are you A to L? Are you A to yes. Z? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm well, McGee. So well, that doesn't so you work. Wouldn't be there. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be there. I, I would. Where were you? I I would I would. So if it's period, so period one, I. <laughs> I'm, I'm with. Let, let's say my my name is um, is I don't know is Alan. Okay. So period one. I'm with my social studies teacher. Well, I'm with my social studies teacher on Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. Okay. And, and you are grades nine to twelve. Correct. Okay. So re regardless of of my grade, I'm with my social studies okay. teacher. Period one. Okay. I'm with my social studies teacher. Period two. Period three, period four, and period five. It's just that in periods two through five, I'm going to be virtual with my second period teacher. So I might have English second period. So I'm still in that same pod, in that same room, but I'm just with my English teacher there. So that, that would be week one. Week two, I would go to second period. So week two, I, I'm with my English teacher, periods one through five, they're teaching me virtually, they're teaching my group virtually, period one, for on, on, um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah. Okay, I, I, okay. Now, what happened on Thursday, week so one? On, on Thursday, period one, when I'm gonna be virtual with my period one teacher on Thursday. So that would be, so, so all kids are there all week? No, they're not. No, they're not there all week. No, they're they're okay. there when well, there's so, a new group there on Thursday. Correct? Yeah. Yes. There's a yes. Right. You're right. There's a new group there. So so me personally, I would be in Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. If, if my last name was A you're through L. Alan, yep. And then Thursday, Friday, I'm virtual. You're home. Yes. Okay. Um. So so. No matter what day it is, you get a live class for the first period, correct? You have a live teacher there teaching you right yeah. there. Yes. And, and then you're sitting at your desk and you're on your computer doing virtual lessons yeah. the yeah. rest of the day. Yes. Why bother go to school? Why not just do that at home? Well, so a, a few things. The, the, the high school felt really strongly that they wanted kids to be in school. They, didn't, they don't want kids to be at home. They want them to have, they want them to have a, a schedule so that they're coming to school and they're going to their classes and they're, they're having those, those classes beyond first period virtual. Um, it was really important to them because they found that they lost a lot of students uh, in the in the spring when they weren't there in person. Well, and they, none of them were there in person, but they they feel as though they would lose more if they don't have a schedule to adhere to, even though they're not going to be face-to-face -face, um, with their teacher. There will be a teacher there with them. And, and that'll be one group Tuesday, Wednesday. Yes. Then they go home Thursday and Friday. Yes. Right? Okay. Well, at least two days you get them into the school. That's the plan. That's right. 
Now, Dr. McGee, what, you're, you're Mr. Allen right now. Yes. So on Tuesday, you showed up, first period, you had your social studies teacher. The following day on Wednesday, yep. you're going back to the same class. Yes. Are you still having the social studies teacher, the same teacher, or that who's who's who do you have now? Yes, I have the same teacher. You do? Okay. Yes. So in that in your two days, you're gonna have the same teacher. The yes. following week could be a science teacher. You're exactly. gonna have that teacher for two days. Yes. And so on and so forth. Correct. Okay. Um, this will be interesting. <laughs> in the least. Mr. Chair? Well. Mr. Chair? Mrs. Kapiskas, please. I have a follow-up question to Mr. Burks, and it's something that I've been thinking about for over a week now, and I don't think we've really addressed it. Assuming I'm in the high school, my name is Kapiskas, so I'm in the Tuesday-Wednesday group. Uh, it's week one. I'm in with my first period class, my first period teacher. During second block, we go to my second period. I'm still sitting in my first period room. I'm doing this virtually with headphones. The person sitting next to me is doing it virtually with headphones. What happens if we want to participate in that second period class? How do we ask questions of that teacher? How do we participate? Considering I'm in one class, I might be in chemistry, and the person next to me might be in stats and problem stats. Mm -hmm. How are right. we going to do that? It's going to be a cacophony. So that's going to be, you're right, that's going to be a challenge. And I, I know I, I've had multiple conversations with the high school and Mr. Henderson and Mrs. Hawkins have assured me that based on the scheduling, this is the only way they can do it to, to, to take into account the number of students that would be moving to just a variety of different classrooms. This is, although this, is, this isn't an ideal situation, it's it's really the only situation in which they can have all of their students participating in in all of their core classes um, as well as their electives. Let me let right. me just. It's, it's going to be it's going to be challenging because you're going to well, have. You know, well, Mr. Skapiskas, the only way you can ask a question is going to be on the Chromebook, because you're right. If I start asking questions about chemistry and you about social studies, somebody else about math, that's not going to go very well. So the only <laughs> so way Ask, you, gonna have, you have to type them in. So you're going to have to use chat, which means the teacher is going to be dragged away from the classroom, constantly checking the chat to answer questions from students who are not in front of him or her, but participating virtually while they are down the hall in Mr. Reese's class. Right. Can I can I jump in, Dr. McGee? Is sure. Okay? Um, so um, as we would do in a regular classroom setting when all of our students are there and we're doing a workshop and we have students rotating around the room, they're all doing individual things in different sections of the room. Uh, in that case, they'd be rotating um, and physically moving. In this case, students with their headphones and Chromebooks would be engaging with their science teacher who's in another classroom in the building, but still virtual with the students from her class. So her second period class are all in her Google Classroom and she's in her classroom with a group of students who are participating in other things in front of her, but she's able to uh, keep eyes on as you would in a classroom when you're doing centers and things and also engage um, with the students who are in um, in the Google Classroom. Um, they can communicate either via um, the chat section or um, speaking just like we are, um, because when you're in a classroom and you have multiple groups working on different things, when you know, we do projects or whatnot, a lot of students are talking at the same time. We keep our, our levels down and we still can engage in those conversations in small group. It would be just like that. We'll have about 15 students in the high school classroom. So every classroom would have about 15 students. And it could be all 15 after the first period or doing uh, something else. Um, but they would be engaged with their, with their Chromebook. Ms. Kapisis, does that answer your, your question? It does, but I, I still think that's not going to be particularly effective for the students that are not physically in the classroom with the teacher who's instructing. I, I understand that there's really no other way to do it other than going to 100% virtual at the high school. Mm -hmm. And I understand why they don't want to do that. But I'm just thinking after the first couple of weeks, we're all going to see this is not going to work. That, that's just my, my instinct having had high schoolers. Mm. 
in in uh, to just to follow up with that comment, um, um, Mrs. Kaviskas, in in the attempt to not even get ourselves into that situation where we're two or three weeks in and going, oh geez, this isn't working. Is there an opportunity to do a very serious dry run um, prior to getting back into school, so that way we have an opportunity to completely recognize what is just going to be non-starters. Dr. McGee? I'm not sure I understand that, Ms. Capo. Can you just repeat that? I didn't quite so hear all. Logistically, it sounds as though, in theory, we can envision a number of people in a room sitting X feet away from each other engaged in their own activities while a teacher is giving a virtual lesson up front. When the real life scenario presents itself, you can recognize sometimes things that were um, perhaps solvable, but you don't realize them until it's too late because everything that you've just put together for your plan of action is simulation in your minds in a best effort to move this forward. While I realize it would have to be um, organized and potentially maybe it is with adults, but if you were to do a mock scenario at the high school of exactly what you would be looking to do a few weeks prior with actual individuals, is there an opportunity there to not have to be testing this out with students in an already stressful situation, maybe physically real in a life environment, test out exactly what it is that you're looking to do? I'm sure Mr. Henderson and his team could do that. Well, it's a good idea because if it's not done, then it's all theory and this could break down day one. But, but so, I, think, I, I think we also understand that this is an experiment that has never been done before. Right. And I believe comments have been made that that we will be adaptable, that that it won't be a surprise if you have to make some changes. Um, and if you're not if you know if you're not going to be surprised, then I'm sure you can work it through. So um, I don't know. I think I think we got to try it out first, but right. and that's a good point, Mr. Burke. You know, this it, it's a plan, um, and the, this plan is is going to be fluid. You know, like I said earlier, we don't know what August is going to bring. We when we start this, we don't know. We we have to be prepared, um, literally the next day to go virtual. If if we're told we have to go virtual, um, and if we need to make modifications to this. You know, we'll make the necessary modifications. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say it, it, it isn't written in stone because then people will say, well, you don't really have a plan. We do have a plan. We have an initial plan, but you know, all good plans um, are are meldable, and and you know, you you have to um, you have to make modifications when necessary. When you know, when uh, presented with with things um and that's something that if we need to do that we'll certainly do that because i can see that even if you do a test run um it's it's going to the test all the those the specific classes will have different experiences some the virtual and some live classrooms within that school are going to work well others may not and they're going to have to fine tune it Mm -hmm. uh, as you go along, or we're going to find out, you know what, this isn't working at all. Uh, we're going to have to change that approach, and you will do that. Uh, right. even if, so if you have a dry run, it's all it is, but it's still not going to be the same when the students come in, uh, because they're going to have a whole different approach to life and, to, and their education. So, you know, we'll, you give it the best shot. Mr. Chair, may I ask one more question? It's Lynn. Yes, Mrs. Kapiskas, please. Um, my question is, I know that, quite frankly, with distance learning, we were kind of underutilizing them with, with bringing students back in, particularly at the elementary school level, we'll be back, bringing back the paraprofessionals into the classrooms at this point, because I think they're going to be needed more than ever, and not just for instruction, but for hygiene reasons and, and enforcing the hygiene with the younger children. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Mrs. Kapiskas. Um, in, in fact, there there have been some districts that have that have laid off um, or are laying off um, paraprofessionals and itinerants. Um, we're not. We haven't, and and we're not going to do that moving forward because, as you just stated, uh, we're gonna we're gonna need them. We're gonna need all hands on deck um, to support our students. 
um, both socially, emotionally, and, and academically, because you know, we're gonna have students that are gonna be coming back to us uh, with, with a, a, a very serious case of, of summer slide. I mean, we, we, we see that normally. Um, you know, and this, this situation is, is one where, you know, our, our students were not in person for, you know, uh, over 13 weeks. Um, the, the, the last part of the uh, reopening scenario, and, and this is going to be district wide um, at each level, is our self-contained students will come back um, Tuesday through Friday. So um, as I stated earlier, and at the elementary level, we would have pre-K, K, at the middle school level, grade six, and then we would also have um, uh, in grades uh, K through 12, all of our self-contained classrooms returning Tuesday through Friday. Dr. Miggy? Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Well, oh, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. I'll, would you I'll address, you. Uh, after Ms. Mrs. Kapiskis' uh, comments or questions, would you address, ma address the issue of mask wearing? Sure, you're well, stealing my thunder here. No, I, you, you <laughs> last spot. Well, That's I got okay. the last spot. I, I didn't I, hear it. I have, a, I have no problem bouncing around here. That's okay. It's all in my head. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Kapiskis, please. <laughs> so. Uh, my, my question is, can I just ask the question with regard to the, the self-contained classrooms coming back? And you've indicated that you're going to provide an opt-out for parents who do not feel comfortable sending their children back for health reasons. There's also been a lot of issues across the state with special ed students not being able to access their services under their IEPs um, because a lot of that is hands-on or hand-over-hand -hand service that we just can't provide virtually. Have we given any further thought as to how we're going to accommodate those issues um, with people who opt out? I realize it's going to bring the numbers down, but it's still going to be an ongoing issue. Thank you. That's right. And we have been talking about it and we're going to be putting plans into place um, you know to um, to answer those questions um, I know uh, dr. Sullivan and uh, mrs. Morell have been working and will continue to work on on that those parts of the plan um, you know as I said earlier there there are some things that we we're, we we're talking about but we haven't come to any any solid, Answers and I, I, I that's across the state that's across the country. Um, you know, there there are so many different scenarios to consider um, But that certainly is is an important and critical scenario And that's that's one in which you know, we're working on and and as soon as we we iron the details out we'll let um, We'll let parents and, and staff uh, know about that uh, Mr. Borgia, do you want me to, to respond to the mask question, if, in, in, unless anyone else has a question? Uh, I'm not going to steal any of your thunder. Why don't you go ahead and, with your presentation and cover it as you see fit? How's that? That sounds great, because I will get to it. I promise Good. you. Good. Uh, the next category that I'm going to talk about is um, the class and group size limits. So, And I'm going to just focus on the partial in-person, which is our plan because it, it varies by, by, um, by plans. So ours is, um, so we would have groups, we, so we would basically be, be cutting groups down um, in half. So at the elementary level, you know, a, an average class size, 24 or 25. So that would be cut to 12 or 13. Um, and that's, that's, it, it would look like that in grades one through five. Uh, at the middle school, we have teams, and contractually, we can't exceed 112 students, which averages out to 28 students. Um, so we do have the, the ability there to, to keep those students in a pod. When I say a pod, I mean a group of students that travels together throughout the school. So the way that would look at the middle school is you have teams of four teachers, so you could have, you can't have more than 30, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say humans in a, in a, in a class um, at once. So if you had, so let's say you had a class of 28, the teacher would be 29. Let's say there was a paraprofessional that was, that was in the class or an interventionist say that went into the class. So we would have a pod size of 30. 
Now, that varies from secondary to elementary. At the elementary level, you can't have a, pod, a, a group size of 30, okay? You could have, you could have a stable group of, of no more than 15, but we would have less than that um, in our elementary classrooms. So, so that, that pod size of 30 um, can be used at the middle school and it can also be used at the high school, but we're gonna be, at, at the high school level, we're gonna have smaller groups. Um, than, than 30. We're going we're gonna to be cutting that in half based on, on the, um, the reopening um, logistics. So, the, so at the middle school, the students would stay in their, in their, in their classroom. So they'd stay in their homeroom. So at, at the middle school, let's say grade seven, you, got, you have four homerooms. Those homeroom teachers, each of those teachers teach a core subject. So the students would stay there and the teachers would then move by period from group to group. Um, we, also, we also have encore teachers. Um, so encore teachers, so, th so those, the pods, those groups can travel through the building to say another teacher. So they could travel to say the art teacher. They could travel to the music teacher. They could travel to the phys ed teacher, but they have to stay in their groups. Anytime a group is traveling in the building, they have to maintain 14 feet distance between another, another group. So that's going to be um, a, a, another category where our, our principals and our, our school leaders are gonna be working on, you know, what, what's that traffic flow gonna be looking like in the school? You, you can't have, you know, I'll use the middle school as an example. You can't have an entire uh, team in the hall together. Um, it has to be broken up by by classroom or by or by pods. So that's what the class group size limits would look like um, at each of our three levels. Does anyone have any questions about that? I do. Um, I go back to what you said. You know, we're got, we've got uh, A to L, M to Z. Isn't that cutting the, the pods down by half? Or are you combining pods on the days they're in school? Because if you, if I'm only A to M, and we had 28, well, right now I may have 14. Right. So, so I have. So how do I? So those those pods will still travel together. So if it's a group of 14 or if it's a group of 30, they're still going to stay together. When they travel, they'll they'll stay together. Um, are you going to have 30? If you have 30 now, you figure on an average they'd be cut in half. Am I, what, something I'm missing. So, so we're breaking the alphabet up. So right. each classroom, right? So you, you take teacher A, they're, they're only going to have students with the last name beginning with A through L. So, so they're yeah. not going to have 30 or 28 kids in, in their classroom. The high school the high school is even going to have lower numbers than that. Right. Um, sure. The guidelines say you can have up to 30 people in a class at once. We're not going to have that. But when they, when they move as a group, they're still going to have to move as a group individually and, and have to maintain 14 feet of distance in, when they're in the building from, oh. other, from other pods. But yeah, um, my pod now is 14. Right. So I never get to 30. No, you don't. We're not going to okay. get to 30. Okay, so it's going to be groups of that 14 that's going to move around to go from one teacher to another teacher. Right, because you're going to each of those homerooms are going to be broken up. So okay. there's normally, right. let's say there's 28 in the homeroom. Um, technically, you could have 28 plus two adults, but, the, but our hybrid plan is cutting that in half. So it's going to be right. you know, up to 14 or so. Right, I'm I'm staying consistent with the with with the plan. Yes. So we're looking at half. So right. we're looking at fourteen at most. Right. That's right. All right. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Chairman, it's Rebecca. Yes. Um, be careful. So, so then, I think that my question is going to be primarily focused on elementary school, and it's specifically in drilling down to the individual classrooms, and not necessarily like the physical square footage size of the classroom, but the types of furniture and desks and assets that actually exist in those classrooms today. Because I'm, I'm sure, because I've, I've been, and there's a lot of non-traditional type of um, 
desks or, or, or sitting sitting spaces. And so do we foresee possibly having to make any capital investments in different type of furniture to accommodate the six foot, or do we think we'll be able to utilize what we have today? So we're gonna be able to utilize what we have today. In fact, what we're gonna be doing, and, and Mr. Natariani and um, his department have, have been going around from school to school, and each school is gonna have sort of a model layout classroom as to what it's what it needs to look like so what, what's happening and what will happen is there's going to be a lot of furniture that's going to be removed from classrooms to maintain the six feet of social distancing when students are, are sitting at their at their chairs um, that doesn't mean that that students can't come closer than six feet um, right but when but the, the the guidance is to try to maintain six feet if they come closer than six feet then they 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 need to have a mask on if if they're coming into close contact like that with either the teacher or or their their peers so so what we're doing is we're we're removing like a lot of you know at the elementary level most most classrooms have you know desks and, and tables and different stations um so a lot of that is is being removed to to make enough room available to adhere to the social distancing of of the six feet thank you so much dr mcgee so non-classroom settings and i i kind of um referred to it a second ago but so when when students are traveling um throughout the school they they need to be separated from other groups that are traveling throughout the school um, they which is which is uh, 14 feet from one stable group to to another stable group um, and I'm, I'm gonna move ahead a little bit but I'll talk a little bit about recess since we're talking about elementary school right now so um, teachers can take their students out for recess um, they what however you can so typically you would you would see um, at, at a given time, say morning recess, you have maybe five classes out uh, at recess at the same time. So we can have stable groups or pods out at recess, but they have to maintain 14 feet between stable groups. So that's a bit of a challenge because a, a typical elementary recess, um, if, if you've ever seen it, um, it it's, it's quite an experience. Um, they, you know, you got Mr. Miss, you know, Mr. Jones's class and, and, and Mrs. Smith's class, they play together. They like to play together. Right. And they, they can't do that in, in this setting. So, um, and again, that's going to be the, the principals with their staff, you know, establishing recess times for groups to go out. So you, you can have multiple groups out there. Um, first you have to have the space, right? Um, so for some schools, they, they could have multiple groups out there. Other schools might be a little challenging because there might be only enough space for, for one class at a time or maybe two classes at a time to go out um, to have recess. But they have to maintain the 14 feet of distance and they have to wash their hands, of course, you know, before they go out and when they come back in um, to, their, to their classroom. Section four, um, and I, I referred to it a little bit uh, just now, classroom layouts and, and use of, of spaces. So you would have students sitting in rows. You know, if, if, you, go, if you go to a typical elementary classroom and, and a middle school classroom, you're going to see groups of desks. You're gonna see whether they're in groups of four or groups of two. Um, and, and that, you know, that's, that's just good classroom um, organization because it offers students an opportunity to collaborate with one another and, and things like that. So in, in this, um, in these classroom layouts, you're going to see it's going to unfortunately be the traditional desks separated facing the front of the room or facing in the same direction. Um, you'd have approximately four rows of, 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 um, of four chairs. Um, and again, that would vary depending on the the physical layout of, the, of, of our classrooms. Um, you know, some classrooms are, are laid out a little differently than others, um, but that's what you would basically see um, in, in the classrooms um, as, as we prepare them for, for the social distancing of our students. Um, 
hallways. Um, you know, each school will develop a, a hallway plan. Um, you know, again, when when um, groups of students are traveling, they they're going to need to. There there will be certain areas that they'll be traveling to. Um, for example, if they're going to you know to the to the bathroom, there will be certain bathrooms that'll be set aside for different groups, um, and you know, teachers would take them there. Um, at the high school, obviously, you know, and and even at the middle school, students don't travel to the bathroom in groups. Um, so, like for example, at the high school, you, you would need to have uh, you can have more than one student utilizing the bathroom at a time. So, you know, Mr. Henderson and his team will have to coordinate, you know, having um, folks on duty at out, outside of each bathroom, ensuring that you know social distancing is is being adhered to. There, um, going to be a challenge, un undoubtedly. Um, but again, each school will establish their you know, there are traffic patterns, if you will, within the buildings. You know, you have to walk, for example, um, especially at the high school and the middle schools, this stairwell will be an up stairwell. This stairwell will be a down stairwell. So we don't have group um, passing one another in the stairwells and, and in the halls. They would need to maintain the 14 feet um, of distancing. Um, lockers, students will not be utilizing lockers. Uh, we have one elementary school that has uh, lockers at Harris, and the middle schools, obviously, in the high school have lockers. Um, they will not be utilizing their lockers. They're, they'll need to, to bring their, um, their, their books and, and their materials um, to, to their classroom. At the elementary level, we're looking at creating potentially boxes for students to use where their uh, resources and their materials go in those. Um, they, they, they won't be putting them in the desks because the desks will be used by multiple groups of students um, at, at the middle school as well, um, although they, they, don't, they don't usually put anything in their desks because their desks don't have holders like the elementary school uh, children have. Um, so they would not be able to, uh, to do that. But we're looking at um, you know, establishing each, each student having a box where they could put their materials in. Um, you know, from, from day to day and, and week to week that they could utilize. Um, and dining. Um, so breakfast, we have uh, universal breakfast. That would be, that'll be served in the classrooms. Uh, we, we've met with Sedexo. We've met with uh, Ellen Shalvey. Um, Mr. Natariani and Mr. Perrier have, have both met with her. And Sedexo has, um, uh, has established a plan in which they'll deliver breakfasts to classrooms and they'll also deliver lunches to classrooms. Um, we're in the process, uh, we'll be working with the principals. The principals have already been putting, putting these, these, their thoughts together in terms of having an, an adult. Um, it would not be the classroom teacher that would be eating with, with the student. Um, we would need to coordinate the lunch times, um, which can be, I think, a little more flexible than what they are currently because currently, you know, everyone's going into the cafeteria. Um, so I think Sodexo can be a little flexible with, with when our lunches are being served how they're, as they're spread out uh, during the afternoon. Um, and we would look to have um, folks, you know, um, monitoring those classrooms when the students are having, having lunch. Um, at the high school, they, they can serve the lunches to the students in their classrooms. Um, the high school can also explore the possibility of, of groups of students going to the cafeteria. Um, but once those students leave, the, the area has to be cleaned thoroughly. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, so it's probably more like more than um, more than likely that that they'll be serving them in their classrooms. Um, cleaning surfaces, uh, category five uh, custodians will be. Um, cleaning, um, actually an, an agenda item later um, under good and welfare is um, the, an additional uh, custodial staff to, to help with the, the cleaning and the disinfecting of the buildings. We uh, don't have good and welfare, Dr. McGee. I, I'm good and welfare. I, I'm sorry, the um, under new business. Okay. So cleaning surfaces uh, will, will be cleaned, uh, you know, regularly. Um, we, we split up by um, 
we, we, we initially considered using Wednesday as a, as a virtual day to, to disinfect the buildings, but we wanted to be, um, we wanted to, we didn't want to take away any more face-to-face -face instructional time for our students by putting that um, on a, um, uh, by, by leaving it on, on Wednesday. So by putting it on Monday, that, that virtual day, um, that's the day that the custodians and, and maintenance um, staff will will be going in and really you know thoroughly cleaning and disinfecting in, in addition to each day um, at, at the end of the day and throughout the day um, they'll have specific schedules where they'll be you know assigned to clean certain areas at, at certain times face coverings so I, I, I finally got to it mr. Bourget I felt like I was taking a hike well, I, I don't want to take you on a hike. I certainly know you've been on one before, and I, I don't want to go there. Um, but I know there's just a lot of stuff here. Yes, sir. So, so face coverings. Um, so the the Department of Ed um, has has issued the the, the guidance that um, that face masks are recommended um, to students in grades two through twelve. Um, so. Here in, 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 our, in, in the district, um, I am going to um, require that, that students have face masks. Now, Ride has also said that um, we, we can't consequence students for not having a face mask or not wearing a face mask. And, and that comes from the commissioner. So what our plan is, and again, we're going to be having this these conversations with our our principals, and they'll share that with their with their staff. Um, is to you know in, encourage the 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 health and the safety of wearing a mask. Um, it, it's it's my belief that that students will not necessarily be wearing a mask six hours of every single day that they're in, they're they're in the building, if students are socially distanced from others, then I believe that they'll, they'll, they could move their mask down. Um, I, I, I don't think it's, as an adult, you know, wearing a mask for six straight hours is, um, is a challenge. So as, as, we, as we look at the expectations, I think there are gonna be certain times when students are gonna need to wear a mask when they're coming in close contact with a staff member or another student. Um, but for example, if, if the student is working at their desk and there is no one you know, within six feet, then um, they can move the mask down. Um, I, I just don't think it's uh, realistic for, for, for every single student to have a mask on every single minute of the day. Having said that, um, I also don't, uh, I, I'm not going to be um, happy if students are, are just, you know, flagrantly not wearing masks and coming into close contact. I think that's a situation where, um, you know, the school would need to reach out to the family and have a conversation with the family to explain to the family the importance of, of a face covering. I know that face coverings has turned into a, um, a political, um, you know, mess in the country. Um, and, and I am of, of you know, I'm, I'm not espousing any political persuasion other than what I feel as though is that is the health and the safety of our students and our staff. Now, there, there will be students who have medical conditions um, in which, and, and that should be documented, um, in, in which they, you know, they, they can't wear a mask. And I think those are situations that we, we need to take on an individual basis. Mr. Chair. Mrs. Kapiskas. Um, as an alternative, are students allowed to wear face shields? So that's a great question. Um, I haven't seen it in any of the literature that Ride has sent out, but that is a question that I'll be sure to ask. Um, I, I know that our, our, our teachers and staff are gonna be provided with a face shield as well as uh, a face covering. Um, that we, we weren't planning on, on providing all of our students with, with a shield, um, but that, you know, I, I want to be practical, you know, when, when, we're, when we're doing this, because we're, we're going to have to be 
we're going to have to be realists and we're going to have to be practical and, and different situations will require, you know, different solutions. And I think that that's a perfectly valid solution um, in, in some instances. But Thank obviously, you. but obviously, we're not planning to providing shields for stu for all students. No, no, we're not. No, not intentionally. No, we're not. Uh, the next section is screening, student and staff screening. So, um, parents will will need to be responsible um, because you know again this this is it, it this goes beyond making this making these these plans work to the best of their ability. It ha we, there has to be collaboration and cooperation between families and, and the schools. Um, so parents will be asked to um, provide um, self-attestation um, for, their, for their children before they leave in the morning. Um, we're going to be sending out to families uh, a link in both in, in Spanish and English of, of what questions they need to ask before they send their child to school. Um, you know, for example, um, does my child have a fever? Um, does my child, um, you know, have, um, have, a, have a cough? If they answer yes to that, they should not send their child to school. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, staff, same thing. There, there, will, there will be a, a self-attestation uh, screener for, for staff. Um, if, if a staff, you know, member has, has a fever, then, you know, they, they should not um, go to school and let, but let their building administrator, you know, know as, as they normally would, if, if they're not going to be um, in on a, on a particular day, they would let them know that. So, so that's, that's the screening. That's what that's going to look like. Um, there are some districts that are looking at creating for families, a, um, like, like a, an app for that. Um, that's something that we can consider. Uh, doing <clears throat> and you know so that that's something that we'll we'll talk about but we'll we'll if if we do choose to to provide an app that parents can use then we'll provide that um, but they will have access to the to the form that we're going to send out to them we'll also put that form on our website and the schools will put it on their website as well fine oh uh, uh, school visitors so um, being in the partial in person, we will not allow for walk-in visitors. Parents are going to need to um, call ahead of time, and that that's going to be a challenge because you know here in our district, we often have parents who who will just show up to the school, um, and that that's not going to be um, um, you know. Uh, approved as as we start the school year so that that's not to mean that they that we can't have visitors in the building they're just going to need to make either make an appointment or call um the school and say you know i i need to come in and 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 pick up my, my son or daughter um, they can't just show up uh, when visitors do come in to the buildings they'll be entering and exiting through the same door and all visitors entering the schools will have to have face masks on Uh, busing and transportation, we talked about that already, so I'm, I'm not going get, to gonna get into that. Um, School-specific activities, uh, field trips, all field trips for the, for the foreseeable future will be virtual only. We will not have students or staff um, you know, leaving our campuses to, to go on field trips. Uh, before and after school programs, as you know, we have... Uh, different community organizations, Connecting for Children and Families, uh, the YMCA, Kids Club, those, those programs will be run um, and we are um, also in contact with them. They have plans that they're establishing, they have reopening plans. Um, the, the one area we have to collaborate with them is that they're, they're going to need to establish pods like we have, like we're going to be establishing so that those kids, um, so, so the pods that the kids have in school will need to be the same pods that they have in those before and after school programs. So they're going to have different groups um, within their, their programming. So, but that's a conversation that we're, we'll have with, with CCF and the Y and, and Kids Club. 
Um, PPEs for school nurses, because obviously school nurses will will be the ones that that are most on the front line, because they're going to they're they they're the ones that will have students that are that are that are sent to them or taken to them that may exhibit some symptoms. Um, so our, our school nurses will be equipped with um, with a variety of um, of PPEs. They'll be they'll receive N95. Uh, res respirator masks, face masks, they'll have a, a face shield, eye protection, gloves, and gowns. Um, students and staff who are ill uh, responding to them in the school during the school day. Um, so any, any student who experiences, is experiencing the symptoms once they're in school um, is, is to be taken to um, or somebody will, will get that student and be brought to the nurse's office. Um, each school has established a room that is going to be um, used to, to keep those students, um, an isolation room, um, and the parents are, will be called immediately and the parents will, um, will, will be requested to, um, to pick up their child as, as soon as possible. The, the guidelines say within the hour um, we, we hope that that's the case, um, but we'll obviously make it um, very, um, um, we'll, 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 we'll stress the fact that they, that they need to come and get their, their student um, a, immediately. So, but, e but each school will have those, um, those isolation rooms. Um, a, any staff member who, who, is, um, who, is, who is, is ill during the day, um, you know, will we'll go home and, um, the um, in in both instances, they the whether it's a staff member or a student, um, they they will be um, required to to contact a doctor and um, to w within within two days um, and get a COVID test if they're experiencing the symptoms of of COVID nineteen. Once they get the results, they 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 are not to return until the results of the test are are completed and are. Uh, and, and the school is notified of the results. If, if, they're, if they're negative, then they, they can return. Um, and if they're positive, then they have to, they have to quarantine themselves for the, the, the number of days based on the, the CDC um, guidelines. So that was a lot. Um, and that's really, believe it or not, that was sort of a, a summary of, of what a lot of people across the district have been spending just endless hours working on. Um, I, I want to thank all of the, the, the directors, the principals, the, the, the staff members, um, the union, um, you know, e everyone, the members of the community who have been um, helping us, parents who have, who have provided some, some feedback to us. Um, th this, is, this is not an easy task. And, um, you know, again, I, I, I want to stress that as the superintendent, I put the safety and, and, the, and, the, and the health of our students and our staff first. And that's why I, I don't believe it's wise for um, an, an entire level to, to come back uh, full time. I think it's best for us to, to start with a hybrid. Hopefully things will, will go um, well and our, our numbers will go down across the state and our numbers in Woonsocket will go down so that eventually with the goal of bringing back more students um, safely um, and, and securely, um, that, that's the goal. But again, I, I want to thank you know everyone that's that's been working on this, and we're not we're, we're not close to being done. This is just the first part. The first part was establishing a plan. Um, as I said earlier, we'll receive feedback from the Department of Education, um, but then the the real nuts and bolts of the plan will be will will be um, you know established when we look at school by school. What are, what are each of these categories? What are each of these procedures going to look like um, as we move forward? And then once we start the year, we're gonna obviously be, be monitoring our plan and looking to make improvements where we feel as though we need to make improvements. Because as, as I said earlier, it's, it's a fluid plan. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Uh, it took an hour just to give us the synopsis. I can imagine how long this plan is gonna be uh, that you're submitting to RIDE. 
um, you figure you got 39 cities and towns that are doing the same thing. So are you expecting to get comments in a week, two weeks, since August is right around the corner? So, so I believe, uh, well, the, the plans need to be um, posted on each district's website on uh, July 31st, I think it is. Um, and I and I believe that Ride is going to provide feedback to districts up until July 28th. So they've got about two weeks in which they're going to provide feedback. Um, I, I I don't know, you know, if if we'll get. I, I suspect that Ride has um, groups of of people who are going to be focusing on certain districts, you know, to divide to divide and, uh, them up like that. So I I would I would expect that we'll receive some feedback, you know, within at, at least within a week. I I, I would be shocked if. If they didn't provide feedback later than that, um, the, 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 I, I do want to end on on um, just letting everybody know what are, what our next steps are here. I know I I, I obviously told everyone that we're going to be submitting the plan. Um, we will be we, we will be sharing the the plan with staff virtually and through email. So between now and Friday, um, I'm going to send out the skeleton of the plan to the staff, um, and I'm also going to hold some virtual uh, Google Hangouts by school um, starting next week to answer any questions that staff members may have. Um, I'll be there, um, union uh, leadership will be there, and I'll also have um, my directors there as well to answer any, any questions. I'm also going to be doing the same thing for parents. Um, I'll be sending out the, the, again, the skeleton of the plan to parents, and um, I'm also going to have some Google Hangout virtual meetings scheduled by school with with to answer parents' questions and and you know comments and any concerns they may have. Um, but I, I but I, I want to just I want to just let everybody know um, my, my disclaimer is that I, I we we may not have answers to every single question. Um, you know, again, this is a process, and um, there are things that we know. There are things that we know through the guidance from the CDC. There are things that we know through guidance of the Department of Education. Um, but there may be some questions where we say, you know, hey, we're, we're going to have to think about this and get back to you. So I, I don't want people to think that if we don't have some answers that, you know, we, we don't know what we're doing. Um, we, we do. But this this is a pretty... Um, it's it, this is a pretty in, incredible process here putting this together and and um, so you know and I appreciate everyone's patience and I appreciate everyone's flexibility you know this this is not any something that any of us want right. uh, but again I I want to I want to move forward in a in a in a smart in a in a prudent way and, and most importantly in a in a safe way. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Um, does any member of the school committee have any more questions or comments? Then I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the superintendent's report that dealt with school reopening. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? You're muted, Don. All right. Uh, Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Yes, yes here too. This is Kapeski. Yes. Uh, next, we have a school subcommittee report, the policy subcommittee. Uh, may I ask uh, Mrs. Kapiskis and Vice Chair Burke to give us the update? Would you like me to do it, Mr. Burke? You do a great job. Please do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, the policy subcommittee met last night at 6 p.m. virtually, and we discussed two policies that are on tonight's agenda. So I'll give you the summary of those so that we can um, avoid having to go through that full summary when we reach them on the agenda. The first is the Title IX policy. As you may recall, we have recently adopted in February a Title IX policy, but new regs were issued by the Federal Department of Education in May of 2020 that had to be implemented by eight, August 14th um, these regs have the force of law and they result in some changes to our policy because it's no longer in compliance. They're the first regs that have been issued since the 1970s. 
Um, and they essentially focus on how schools respond to sexual harassment allegations. And there's significant a number, number of changes. The thrust is to ensure that due process and equal procedures apply to both the complainant and the respondent. It may feel rushed as we go through them, but again, it has, to, we want to, because the new regs take effect on August 14th, we want to make sure that our policy is in compliance by that date and by having our first reading tonight and a second reading and our first meeting in August, we will be in compliance. Um, the, the new procedure is akin to a court-like proceeding. It tightens the definition of what a Title IX allegation is. And if a complaint does not actually reach the level of a Title IX allegation, the LEA, the school district, must dismiss the complaint. For example, it can't be an isolated incident, one occasional bad word, or an occasional inappropriate joke. The conduct must be persistent and repeated in order for it to fall within a Title IX issue. Otherwise, it would be dealt with by our student code of conduct or our bullying policies. Um, there's two procedures set out. One is a formal procedure, which is implied when a suspension, either in or out of school, is the proposed consequence. An informal procedure is fined for any consequence of less than suspension. Um, we set up a process by which the informal procedure will be determined by the superintendent's designee or designees, and the superintendent will be the hearer of appeals, and that's to try to avoid appeals coming before the school committee due to the sensitive nature of typical Title IX complaints. Um, it also does contain, because it was discussed last night, that there's uh, language in there that provides repercussions to staff if they know of a Title IX violation and do nothing. It provides that they too can and will be disciplined for violation of, of Title IX. Um, and I ask Sarah, if you have anything you want to add to that, to please do so. You're muted. The only thing, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yep. The only, uh, the way I would best describe it is that the Title IX regulations have essentially made all adults um, in the school community akin to mandated reporters if they see a Title IX offense. Um, and we talked about some training so that staff understand what that means and, and don't feel that they're being um, potentially punished or, or, or subject to punishment for something that they don't understand. It, it, it is uh, not as, as scary as it sounds, but it does, the, the new regs do put a, a significant responsibility on the entirety of the adult community to, to be proactive if something uh, is believed to rise to that level. That's all. Thank you. Uh, the second policy we discussed is the student discipline policy and essentially the changes uh, to the student discipline policy involve essentially two areas. The first is a change with the reference to the Title IX policy that if we are talking about a Title IX violation, in accordance with the new regs, it would be processed under the Title IX policy, not the student discipline policy. Um, so that there's only one hearing for whatever the, the situation is. If it's Title IX, it's a Title IX procedure. If it's not Title IX, it would be student discipline. And we also are taking out the threat assessment language with regard to the term, uh, the meaning of a demonstrable threat. Um, council has asked for guidance from Wright as to what they mean as to a uh, demonstrable threat with threat assessment language. Um, they haven't really gotten a clear response. Um, there's also concerns that a student, basically the threat assessment was a procedure by which we would evaluate a student to determine whether or not we think they're truthfully a threat to themselves or the student body or the staff. Um, and essentially a student can present a demonstrable threat without actually having a threat assessment. For example, a sexual assault under Title IX or a violent fight can occur before a threat assessment can be conducted and would still ne might necessarily justify an average district suspension. So as a result, we're making a, a change to take that threat assessment language out of the student discipline policy while leaving the demonstrable threat language in. Um, and 
in terms of how this is going to be addressed because there were questions from the administrators on the committee that there's going to have to be additional training provided to the principals either as part of an administrative retreat if one occurs or as part of the PD Academy before the start of the school to go over both the Title IX and the student discipline policy and the changes that we've made. Uh, do you have any additions, Sarah? Okay, in light of that, um, that's the end of my report. Other than our next meeting will be on August 5th, 2020 at 4 p.m. Not sure yet if that'll be live or virtual. When we'll be discussing the physical restraint policy as well as digital citizenship, which I had no idea what that was, but apparently it's how to behave electronically as a result of distance learning. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Mrs. Kapiskas. Uh, any comments or questions? of Mr. Skopiskis on these policies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to add briefly that sure. uh, the, the Title IX policy that, that we finalized took a great deal of extra work because of so many changes. So I just want to thank our, um, our attorneys, Caroline and Sarah, for really doing a, su a superb and super job making all those changes. It was a complete reworking uh, almost a brand new policy, so they did a great job, and thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thanks a lot, Caroline. <laughs> Anyone else? Then I'll make a motion to receive and place and on file the, facility, the uh, policy subcommittee update. Is there a second? Second. Second of Mrs. Capwell, Dr. McGee. Roll call. Yes. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Thank you. Next, we'll go into the facilities and technology update. And I'll ask Mr. Notoriani if he would be so kind as to give us that update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It will be a brief update. Um, so for technology, and I apologize, there's a couple of typos in my memo this evening. But for technology, at this point in time, as typical of this summer months, there are uh, three work orders in the system pertaining to um, a password reset, website issue, and the repair of a staff laptop. So this is generally a quiet time of the year with regard to the response to work orders. And we're currently in the process of upgrading our network components throughout the district in anticipation of the students returning and the virtual learning or hybrid virtual learning environment we will be undertaking in the fall. Aside from the technology hardware issues and upgrades, we are in the process of concluding our end of year state reporting for RIDE. We're in the process of uploading our final enrollment, discipline, student contact, homeless attendance, and working in conjunction with Dr. Holt evaluate, and, and, and Mrs. Um, Dargan, the uh, evaluation data. So those are the key state reports that we need to uh, finish and get up to ride by the end of the month and um, proceed forward with the next upcoming school year. Uh, in terms of facilities custodial updates, um, again, that's quite brief. Uh, I, I guess, uh, basically, the custodians have come back to the buildings as of last Friday. They are in the process of doing a um, deep clean in all of the classrooms from top to bottom, um, in, in addition to the, the cleaning process that they're undergoing in all the classrooms. They are also starting to modify the classroom spaces. So, and then we'll go into details, Dr. McGee um, indicated earlier. We are rearranging classrooms, moving furniture, and prepping the buildings in anticipation of carrying forward the plans that Dr. McGee uh, has outlined earlier. Uh, in addition to that, the facility staff are continuing to maintain the buildings, provide repairs uh, and maintenance to um, ceiling tiles, lighting fixtures, conducting the yearly inspections that have now resumed with the fire department, building inspector, electrical inspector. In addition to that, they conducted a uh, plumbing um, audit throughout the district. So one of the key things that we need to make sure is working is our hot water and cold water in as many locations as possible so that you can do the frequent hand washing that's necessary. That um, pretty much concludes what's going on. Just a couple of things. Um, have we, and you may have said in the last meeting, but have you received all the Chromebooks you were supposed to get back? And then for the new students, how we, uh, uh, when do you plan on ending, you know, bringing Chromebooks to the, the students who don't have them and probably replace those that have been broken? So, uh, turn it over to you. So, we received approximately 90% of the senior class Chromebooks back. Um, we still have a few that are going to be returning them um, for various reasons. Some are participating in summer programming. 
Right. Um, and, and then there's a few that we need to catch up with, but the vast majority of the summer, uh, the senior class Chromebooks have been returned. Families have been returning Chromebooks for those families that are leaving the district, moving to maybe another state or another LEA here in the state. They've been returning their Chromebooks as well. We have a, a drop off pickup area at McPhee scheduled three times a week. Um, and in anticipation for the upcoming school year, we have uh, registrations are done in my department. We have a, a, a list of all the new students that are registered so far. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but we have accounted for all of them to have a Chromebook available. For the incoming kindergartners, which will be the, the entire class, and then for any new students here in the district, we anticipate providing them a Chromebook on their first um, day, day back to school where they physically come back to school. So on that day, whatever it may be, depending upon the, the, the uh, first initial year last name, we'll have a Chromebook device available for you to, to use throughout the school day and take back and forth with you uh, to and from school. Okay, and I, and I would imagine the parents will have to be trained, those uh, new parents of, of the kindergartners, if they uh, have not used the Chromebook in the past and how do they access the programs they need to, I would imagine that's all part of the bargain. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Mrs. DeRiso and Dr. Holt and myself, um, last year we have the technology coaches, I apologize, that's not their title, I think it's distance learning coaches or blended learning coaches, um, created uh, with, with Mrs. DeRiso and Dr. Holt, they created a program and they held uh, Google Hangouts to train parents on, on how to use the technology or how to assist their child in using the technology. And I, I expect that that will be something that resumes in the fall, okay. correct? And the last thing I have is some parents have texted me, emailed me um, regarding the bathrooms in different schools. I mean, are you visiting those bathrooms to make sure that they're extra clean? Um, they were indicating to me that even on a regular day, they were not that clean. So I hear, you know, I, I hear that, but, you, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing this every day with your staff. So are you making sure not only the classrooms, but. I guess the bathrooms have to be scrubbed down or whatever, whatever, whatever the issues were. So I think, uh, so I can't speak for the past. I can, I can tell you for the upcoming school year that that will be um, the number one priority is making sure that the bathroom restroom facilities are um, kept clean. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe at the elementary level that it should be even easier to keep them clean because bathroom breaks in general as a whole class will be scheduled. So there'll be periodic scheduling and when they will go to the, the bathrooms, not to say you won't be able to use it when you don't go for your designated time. Uh, for elementary level for bathrooms that are in the classrooms, and we have some bathrooms that are in the classrooms, those will be cleaned frequently, probably a couple of times a day. And at the middle school and high school level, there'll be a, a set schedule to have them clean multiple times a day as well. And as this Dr. McGee indicated later in the agenda, we have a request for additional custodial staff uh, and we can explain the purpose of, of that staff and how they will assist in maintaining the uh, enhanced cleaning procedures that we need to uh, roll out in order to bring our students back in the fall. Thank you. Anyone on the school committee have any comments, questions for our director? Then I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the facilities and technology update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas. Yes. Next, we'll go into unfinished business. I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the student education re records and confidentiality policy for second passage. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell and Vice Chair Burke. Um, Mrs. Kapiskas, you want to take this over? I know uh, you've talked about it, but you want to, do we need uh, any more discussion on this policy since it's, it's the second passage? Essentially, it's just a policy dealing with FERPA and student rights to privacy in their student records. I think we kind of probably beat it to death the last meeting, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but that's, it's the FERPA policy we referred to at the last yeah. meeting. Thank you. Dr. McGee. Uh, Chairman uh, Borgia. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Papiscus. Yes. Next, I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the Title I Parent Involvement Policy for second passage. Is there a second? 
Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Um, any further discussion on the policy? Nope. Dr. Yeah. McGee? Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapitkas? Yes. Next, we'll go into new business. I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the amendments to the Title IX policy to comply with the new federal Title IX regulations for first passage. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Mrs. Kapiskas, I know you spoke about that in your subcommittee report. Is there anything else we need to add? I don't believe so, Mr. Chair. Anyone for additional comments, questions? No. Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Next, I'll make a, a motion to discuss and approve the amendments to the student discipline policy for first passage. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Capwell. Again, do we need uh, any further discussion on this, on this item, on this policy? I don't believe so unless there are questions. No. Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapitkas? Yes. Thank you. Next, I will make a motion to discuss and approve the revised 2020-2021 school year calendar for first passage. Is there a second? Second. Second, Mrs. Copwell. Dr. McGee, would you want to lead this discussion? I well, know we yes. yes, Chairman. So I um, did not put the link in um, with the new calendar. So I, I think what we should, um, for, for this, for this um, first passage, I think I can explain what the calendar looks like. And then at the next meeting, I'll, I'll have the link on there with the calendar. Um, what, what I did is I combined the, the state recommended calendar, uh, which the um, commissioner sent out to districts about maybe a month or so ago. Um, and in that calendar, there are, um, there are specific professional learning days or PD days uh, for teachers. And they are, um, they're typically on Mondays. Um, so it's one Monday each month um, minus uh, June and February. So that, um, that, that's, that's going to be a, a difference from the calendar that the committee approved. Um, in, in the early spring. Um, we, we're, we're also including some, um, some, hol some holidays that we haven't observed in, in the Woonsocket Education Department um, in the past. Um, and that, that came out again through RIDE, um, Yom Kippur um, being one of them. Um, so we're gonna recognize them because I, I wanna stay consistent with the, the calendar that the state is, is using. First day of school, um, across the state is August 31st and the last day of school um, that uh, that the state recommended was June 18th. Now districts do have the latitude if they choose to um, to extend the year if they wanted to add, you know, but we're, we're not going to do that because the calendar that they provided us um, has 180 days uh, for students. So what, I, what, I've, what I'm doing is I'm taking that, their calendar and I'm taking our existing calendar, which lists all of the um, school committee meeting dates, as well as the um, parent-teacher conferences, um, as well as staff orientation. One, one of the things that we're going to do differently this year, um, we normally have uh, staff orientation the, uh, the week prior to the first day of school and staff orientation includes um, all of the district staff going to the high school auditorium. And, you know, we, I welcome everyone back, you know, various people speak. And we also provide um, some, some updates on various policies and the way we're going to handle that this year, because we can't have everyone back um, in, in one setting, we're going to do this virtually. So we'll be, we'll, we're gonna give the, the staff in the district um, a window of, of a week prior to returning to school on August 31st to view um, any videos we send out, welcome back videos, um, any videos where we're 
you know, just providing information to the to the district staff um, leading leading up to the new school year, um, and and just as importantly, there'll there'll be a slide deck where um, staff members will be required to go in and and uh, make themselves aware of specific policies that um, they'll have to sign off on after they've viewed the slide deck, mm -hmm. so that we know that they have. Um, review these policies. That's something that that's mandated. Um, school districts have to uh, do this. And the way we've done it in the past was in person. Um, and so moving forward now, even, even beyond this year, um, even when we're back, you know, to, to normal things, um, we're going to utilize uh, this, this slide deck for staff to, to sign off on uh, looking at the policies and procedures. So that's, that's the, those are the main differences to the, the calendar that the school committee approved in the early spring. And as I said, at the next meeting, I will have all of these things combined into one calendar for the, for the committee to, to actually see what I just described to them. And I, I apologize for not having the, the link on. Dr. McGee, obviously we passed this for first passage. We see it, uh, we see the link next time. Um, Obviously, this it still could be a work in process, depending on what happens with the return to school. Because if if things change in terms of, say, we all go virtual, the, the entire school has to go. We have to go virtual. The district mm -hmm. has to go virtual, based right. on say, a surge in the virus. Um, I would imagine the calendar could 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 change. There's the some part, the, that yeah. it might require a change. Potentially, but if let's say we something happened, you know, in, in the state and, and we do, you know, everyone has to go virtual, begin the year virtually. The dates aren't going to change really. The first day won't change because that would just be the first virtual day of the school year. So it probably won't change um, regardless of, you know, what we're presented with at the end of the summer. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chair Burke. Um, uh, Dr. McGee, you used the word that this calendar was recommended by the Department of Ed, but I was under the impression that it's mandated well, by yeah, the Department I, of Ed that all school districts are following this calendar. Um, I was kind of surprised that there was no pushback, or at least I haven't yeah. seen any pushback. I know some school districts that got rid of their February vacation probably were a little bit upset with this, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. it just seems like the whole, the whole state's going to follow the same calendar, um, which is which is something that's never happened before because calendars were voted on by school committees. Right. You know, each district had their own uh, their own calendar. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, you probably noticed in this new one, uh, there were no snow days. <laughs> there are no snow days. That's right. The because snow days are officially gone. We're so good at virtual learning that, uh, you know, to, uh, to me that's a major loss, but that's okay. So right, but no. To answer your question, um, Mr. Burke, you're right. So so it's mandated, but the the part that is left up to districts is if they wanted to extend the the, the year for some reason, um, or if they didn't want to recognize all of the religious holidays. Um, but the other parts of the of, of the calendar, like the professional days, um, are are, are set in stone and the first day is set in stone as well. I I would suggest that on a, if it does snow, maybe you can have a, a virtual snowstorm uh, on, on, on the Chromebook. So we all could appreciate the fact that we have a snow day, but we still have to do some work. I you might think, consider that. I think that's something Mr. Natariani and his department can, can work on. I think for sure. sure. I'm sure he's got it. He's, he's got this. Um, any other thoughts or questions for uh, for Dr. McGee? So I'll make a motion. Then uh, Dr. McGee, roll call for first passage. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis, you seem to have a question. Did you have a question on this? No, I was muted. I forgot to put my mic on. Oh, okay. Uh, next, I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the appointment of an of the assistant principal at the Hamlet Middle School. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Great. 
Um, Dr. McGee, would you tell us why we need to do this and who you're recommending? Absolutely. In fact, I have a, a nice little uh, little write up here that I'll that I'll read to the to the committee and everyone else who's listening. But we we the reason we're doing this is because um, at Hamlet Middle School last year, uh, the assistant principal left the district in the winter, um, so that position went unfilled for the remainder of the year. Just before we went out um, on virtual uh, on our virtual learning, we had brought in. Um, um, a, a substitute, um, an, an administrator who, who had the certification to help uh, Ms. Renegaldo and her leadership team. And the, the gentleman was only there for maybe a couple of weeks and then we went out. So that's, that was the, that's the reason and, and the need for the, for the position. But, but I'm, I'm pleased to recommend uh, Wendy Todd Fies for this position of assistant principal at Hamlet Middle School. Ms. Todd transferred to her new position with over 20 years of service for the Woonsocket Education Department, most recently as the Dean of Students for Hamlet Middle School. Last year, she completed and obtained certifications in mental health, first aid, and restorative practices. Prior to becoming the Dean of Students, she served as middle school health and physical education teacher for the Woonsocket Education Department for 19 years. Her position included preparing creative, challenging, and age-appropriate lesson plans, developing and maintaining a positive school culture, and learning environment for all through a collaborative effort with administrators, teachers, coaches, parents, and students. Ms. Todd also worked as a summer school behavior specialist, overseeing the summer school PBIS initiative, behavior issues, and to motivate students attending summer school in grades six through eight. Furthermore, for the school year 2018-19, her principal added the additional responsibilities for school dismissal as part of her pursuant of a, as part of her pursuit of a master's degree in educational leadership. Ms. Todd completed her master's in education for educational administration in the spring of 2020 while maintaining a 4.0 GPA. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in Physical Education from Rhode Island College. Based on Ms. Todd's education and work experience, I highly recommend her for the position of Assistant Principal for the Hamlet Middle School. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Good. Uh, does anyone have any comments, questions? I think I think we've seen Ms. Todd a couple of times yeah. on, the, uh, on the screen here, so uh, uh, congratulations to her. So. Well, let's vote it in then. <laughs> Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Congratulations, Wendy. Good job. <laughs> now, does, this, does this mean we need a new dean of students? That is correct, Mr. Burke. Okay. <laughs> and that's coming up not today, but <laughs> I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the appointment of an assist, the assistant principal at the Woonsocket High School. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Koppel. Again, Dr. McGee, would you tell us why we need to do this and who do you recommend? Absolutely. So um, Mr. Boulay, Brian Boulay, um, has elected to return to the classroom um, next year. Um, and as a result, we have um, a vacancy uh, of, of an assistant of a 12-month assistant principal at the high school. Last year, we um, had the uh, had the luxury of of hiring uh, a, a gentleman um, who um, has been in the 10-month um, assistant principal position at the career center. Um, so, based on um, this gentleman's uh, work ethic and collaboration and leadership, uh, we all felt as though. Um, he was uh, more than deserving of um, going to the high school to the 12-month assistant principal position. So I'm pleased to recommend Mr. Jeff Gio for the position of assistant principal for academic affairs at Woonsocket High School. Mr. Gio transfers from his most recent position as assistant principal, 10 months for the Woonsocket Area Career and Technical Center. During this time, Mr. Gio is the chair of the school improvement team an integral leader during the distance learning process, and he worked directly with the math and unified arts department during this time. Also, his technology skills helped spearhead some of the leadership team decisions that were made at the high school. Previously, Mr. Gio was principal at Deering Middle School in West Warwick. There he worked with over 1,100 students and 120 staff members, building leadership skills necessary to be an effective school administrator. 
Concurrently, he works for college boards, serving in a variety of roles in the area of curriculum design, instruction, and as a facilitator for educator professional development. Mr. Gio holds a master's degree in secondary school administration from Providence College and a bachelor of education in secondary education and mathematics. He is highly qualified per the Rhode Island Department of Education regulations as a building level administrator. Based on Mr. Gio's education and work experience, I highly recommend him for the position of assistant principal for Woonsocket High School. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Anyone have any comments or questions? Uh, do, Chairman. Vice Chair Burke. Um, I, I just want to say to, um, to thank Mr. Boulay for his many years of service as an assistant principal, especially earlier this school year when he did step in as acting principal and, and really made a, a great contribution. So as he's leaving, I think it's a moment to say thank you to him as we, as we also welcome Jeff into the position. It's also nice that Mr. Boulay is not leaving town. That's certainly part of our system. So it's great to have to keep him. Yeah, Anyone Mr. else? Mr. Chairman, if, if I could um, just, um, you know, just echo Mr. Burke's um, sentiments, I, I, I want to thank Mr. Boulay. Um, we've worked with Brian for many, many years as assistant principal at Winsocket High School, and, and Brian is a consummate professional. Um, anything you ever asked him to do, he did. Um, and it, it was it was an honor to work with him. And, you know, I, I echo your sentiments, Mr. Burke and, and, and uh, Chairman Bourget. Uh, we're just we're glad he's not leaving the district. Um, and, um, you know, again, just just thank you to Mr. Boulay for his uh, years of service as an administrator. Yep. Not only the beginning of the year, but you close the year as well uh, with a great job on the graduation and all the exercises and award ceremonies that took place virtually and all the planning uh, and execution that had to take place for that to be successful. And he had a, uh, a large, he had a hand to, uh, in doing that and did a great job. Um, Dr. McGee, roll call for the appointment. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Capwell. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus. Yes. Congratulations, Jeff. Good Great stuff. Um, number six, we've already covered. We, also, we, we need a new uh, assistant principal in the uh, career center now, right? Yes, we do. Maybe, maybe what we can do is we've got. I know some retired uh, teachers that might want to do that. Do you? How about you, Doctor McGee? <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Yes. I see a guy in the corner, my corner right here. <laughs> uh, uh, retired means retired. Vice <laughs> Chair Burke. Uh, next, I'll make a, a motion to discuss and approve the hiring of additional custodial staff, uh, especially during this pandemic. Is there a second? Second. Second of Mrs. Capwell. Dr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I referred to this um, when I rolled out our district plan. Um, you know, security safety um, is is utmost in, in our plan and in, in, in rolling out and implementing our plan. Um, the the our, our custodians will be playing a critical, critical role in ensuring that our schools are are disinfected and are clean and are safe. Um, and currently we we don't have enough custodians to to really provide the amount of, um, of, of hours to clean and disinfect our buildings, not only um, you know, when, when students aren't in session, but, but most importantly, when students are in session and they have to, you know, as Mr. Natariani uh, spoke a few moments ago about you know, cleaning bathrooms uh, I, you know, almost every hour on the hour, um, not to mention cleaning spaces where students um, exit where uh, you know another pod of students might be um, entering. So it's critical that we have um, enough um, custodial support in the district so that our students and our staff are are working in buildings that are that are clean and and are disinfected. So um, you have in your um, in your packet here. Um, Dr. Excuse me. Could, we have Mr. could Mr. Perrier uh, show us? Put this up on the screen; it'll be easier. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me uh, let me share it with everybody. Right. Hmm. 
There we go. So what you see here um, is fiscal impact additional custodial staff. So we're, we're asking the committee to approve 15 additional um, custodians who will be working 15 hours a week um, at 17.40 uh, per hour. The reason we um, decided on the number of 15 is that we are looking to, in addition to the custodians we have in our buildings, and we have a, a first and second shift custodian in, in our buildings. In some buildings, I, I believe Mr. Mutariani are, are shared with um, some second shift custodians. Um, I know it used to be like Coleman and, and the Career Center. Um, but the, the, the ask of 15 is based on having um, two additional custodians at Woonsocket High School again, due to the sheer size of the building, um, two additional custodians at the career center. And, and those two can, can go back and forth from the high school and the career center. Um, each middle school would have two additional custodians. Uh, and then each of our elementary schools would have an additional one custodian. So that makes up the 15. Um, I, I also want to note that these custodians are, would be considered district custodians and would not be assigned to a specific building. Um, and, and the reason for that is if we needed to have a custodian um, go to a school that was in need of, of you know, um, disinfecting or, you know, it should, should something occur at a school and we would need more um, custodial staff there, we would have the flexibility to move them. Um, but, but the the focus uh, or the plan would be that each building, each secondary building would have two um, and each elementary school would have one additional um, custodian. The, the, um, the second part of the uh, request is um, um, adding a custodial supervisor stipend. And uh, let, let me explain a little bit about what, what that means. So we have a first shift um, custodial supervisor. Um, that's actually Mr. Bob Lizott. And Bob works the first shift, and but he also oversees all of the custodians um, during the first shift. So we have our second shift custodians, and we do not have a second shift supervisor. So often what happens now is if there's an issue in the evening, then the custodians will call Bob Lizot and we have to pay him overtime to come in and you know provide in is a supervisory role and it's it's also it's it's just good practice and we've seen this with our first um, shift supervisor in just having that person there all the all the time but it's not an additional person it's just a, an additional stipend to that person's salary. Um, and, it, and we feel as though it's it's critically important, especially now, you know, as as we um, are, are entering this this phase of of you know our virtual our our hybrid learning, and having to ensure that our schools are are clean and you know our our, our bathrooms are are, are clean. Um, it, it's just much more efficient to have a custodian um, in addition to their custodial duties act as that supervisor for the second shift custodians. I noticed that the schedule says that temporary, uh, temporary till when, is that until the, the pandemic eases? When, when do you, how long do you see this uh, going on? The, how long do you see us keeping these temporary, these temporary uh, custodians, Dr. McGee? So I, you're 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 correct. I, I think it's it's as long as we need them. Um, you know, we don't we don't know how long we're going to need them. Hopefully, you know, this um, you know the fall will you know something will will happen with respect to the you know to COVID, and um, you know we we won't we won't need them um, for for a long period of time. But um, it, it's just really a sort of a, a, a backup for us, so that we 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 do have an appropriate number of staff, of custodial staff, for as long as we need them. Um, and then when we, when we, uh, that, that we, we no longer need them, then that's when, when their, the, their tenure would end. I, I don't, I don't know if Mr. Natariani has anything that he'd like to add to that. I can see these for a week, uh, for a year. 
uh, the, the, uh, the total salaries, if you divide that by the weekly expense, it's for 52 weeks. So we're yeah. talking about this is we've annualized the cost. Correct. Just in case it takes a year. Correct. And, and, and in terms of, of the, um, the, the, the funding for these positions, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're looking, we, we are going to be um, completing applications um, for CARES Act funds for district uh, COVID funds. And that's, that's money that we, could, we would be able to use towards these positions um, because we're adding these positions due to the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Mr. Perrier, what's the likelihood of us getting uh, the CARES Act grants? Oh, I, I think it's I think it's very good that uh, we'll be receiving the funds. Um, the applications have just come out uh, last week, so we're starting to dig into that and really figure out what we're going to be using the money for. Right now, it's looking like we're going to be using that money to fill in the gap, at least for last year. Uh, the state aid that we lost is going to uh, the CARES Act money will come in and fill in that hole there. Uh, we'll be looking at how to utilize the funding, additional funding for fiscal year 21, and we'll be putting together an application for that as well. Thank you. Vice Chair Burke, I think you had comments or? No, no, I think uh, the question I had, you raised it, but how, how long is this, are these positions going to be in place? So, oh, good. Hopefully, hopefully not the whole year. Let's hope not. Well, if needed for the whole year, then we need we it. We've got it. Sure. Any anyone else? Any other comments? Chairman Bourget. This is Capwell. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just want to say that I I am in support of this. Um, I I think that our teachers and our students are going to have so much more to to practically deal with um, as we go into this this new environment that. Um, being able to satisfy the simplest requirement, and I, I, I don't mean to understate it by saying simplest of requirements, but to give them a, an assurance that they're going to have the best efforts possible for a sanitary environment is just the least that we can we can be doing. So just wanted to, to say that, yes, I am in support of this. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Um, checking my agenda. Looks like we've run, run out of items. So I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 9.18 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Dr. <laughs> McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Capwell? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. We are adjourned. I want to thank you all uh, for attending this 